Okay, so with the ghost game set up as a Markov decision process, we can find an optimal policy using a particular technique called value iteration. Um, and I'm just going to give a broad brush strokes overview of how value iteration works. Uh, I have a little diagram over here, so which, which is supposed to be helpful, but <laughs> may not actually be. So what instead I'm just going to do is give you an intuition for what's going on and how we solve this kind of problem. Um, so first of all, we start by thinking, what if we stopped playing, we just stopped playing the, um, the ghost game? How good is the, the situation that we are in now? As, as, a, as a sidekick, um, and we just have the state of the world that we're looking at, how good is it to be in this, in this particular state of the world? So, uh, in a nutshell, if we're both standing on top of the ghost that, um, that the human is going for, it's great. If it's anything else, that's nah, pretty garbage. <laughs> now, imagine that we had just one action that we could take before we then stopped doing anything um, and, and the world kind of came to an end. What is the best action that you could take? So if you could both, if you could take the action which ended up with both of you standing on the ghost that the human is looking for, then that would be the best action to take. And everything else would be kind of garbage, really. Um, OK, so now, having established that, we take one step back and we think, all right, so just say I had two actions left to go from the state, from some state that I'm considering being in, right? Um, how good would that be? Well, if, it's, if I can take an action which would get me to a, um, a state which I worked out was good from when I was considering what would happen when I had just one action, then I already know, having worked out that from the, the place that I can be with one action um, to go and having it turn out well, that I ought to go to that particular state. So the point is, right, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, each, each round of working out how good the, any given state of the world is, um, thinking of, think about where we could reach, so what, what new states of the world we could get to um, by taking any of our available actions. And then we're going to use pre-computed values that we've already thought about where we have fewer steps to go until the world ends um, to get an idea for which of the actions from our current state we ought to have taken. I think I'm just going to move on. <laughs> I can go back to this later if I need to. Okay, so, but in a nutshell, that is how DERF actually does what it does. And that is also one way of approaching how uh, approaching solving the ghost game. So, value iteration is not terrible. Um, you can legitimately solve Markov decision processes and therefore solve the ghost game or solve DERF and work out um, what the best policy is and what you want to do in any given state. Um, and, and it works reasonably well. However, things get tricky when you consider that you might not always know what ghost the human is going for. Um, so, if I know uh, that if I know that the that the human is going for Clyde, then I just know that the best action for me to take would be to go south. Um, however. If I suspect that the human may actually be going for, I think it's Inky, I don't remember. No, Pinky. Um, then the best action for me to do is to go north. So, uh, assuming that I am the sidekick, right? So, I, I always talk from the, side, from the sidekick's perspective because I'm a robot. Um, 
So this uncertainty adds this extra wrinkle to the whole markup decision process setup, which makes it what's called partially observable. So there are things about the world which we can see. So for instance, we can see the locations of all the ghosts, we can see the location of the human, etc. cetera. Um, and there's no ambiguity as to what state that observable portion of the world is. But there is something which you can't see, and that is what the human's intentions are. So that adds this idea of partial observability. Um, and things can get more hairy if we consider that sidekicks might not be able to see round corners, or humans might not be able to see round corners. So for instance, this guy could not see that guy. Um, so there might be, so it might be because um, we've set up the game in a way so that we just don't display ghosts uh, that aren't in line of sight. Uh, then that becomes a much, much harder problem to solve. Um, and I can give you an intuition for what I mean by much, much harder. Um, okay, so there is this famous class of very hard to solve problems in computer science called the NP-complete problems. And if you can solve these problems in a reasonable amount of time, if you can show a way to solve them in a reasonable amount of time, then you can win a million dollars, I seem to remember. It's one of the Millennium Prizes in mathematics. So uh, they're really, really hard to solve. So and that prize has been offered for a while, too. And that prize has been offered for a while. <laughs> Back when a million dollars was worth more. Yeah. So <laughs> finding an optimal solution for a POMDP, that is uh, solving to get a, solving a POMDP to get a policy which tells you the best thing to do in any given situation, turns out to be a thing called P space complete, which is known to be at least as hard, if not harder, than NP complete problems. And the way the way that by the way that the way this complexity stuff works is you you say okay, just say that I could solve a POMDP. Then I could use my POMDP solver to solve something which is a really hard problem. Um, and this is called a reduction from uh, the POMDP into the really hard problem. And because we know that the really, really hard problem is really hard, then it must be that solving POMDPs is at least as hard as that problem. Or otherwise, you would just be able to solve POMDPs and cheat um, in the hardness of the solution. All right. And this other one, this decentralized POMDP case, which I talked about with blocks of line of sight, is even worse. It is X space complete, trying to solve it, which is frighteningly harder than P space complete. Um, it's much harder than, like, like, it's degrees of difficulty, so orders of magnitude harder than NP complete problems, which are some of the hardest problems in computer science. Um, and also, if you formulate things in a particular way, so like if, there's a, if there's a particular wrinkle in your problem, then they can be what's called undecidable. And undecidable problems are problems in computer science for which no computer program can be written. Um, and it is theoretically provable that no computer program can be written to these things. And this is things like um, anything which uh, could you solve it would let you uh, solve the whole thing problem in computer science, which is like the very famous problem which Alan Turing showed uh, couldn't be solved using a computer and led to the entire uh, field of theoretical computer science. And the solution to the Entscheidungs problem, which David Hilbert proposed back at the start of the 20th century. <laughs> All right. So, um, so in short, uh, if we could work out how to do dearth optimally with block line of sight and, um, and also modeling human cognition so that we could deal with this uncertainty about humans, then potentially we could write a program um, which could do impossible things. <laughs> so it's not possible um, in general. So what do we do? <laughs> OK, so let's think about what we do with dirt. Um, and what DERF in fact does. So first of all, DERF just doesn't deal with this unobservability at all. So walls don't block line of sight. We just assume that we can see everything. Um, 
But that still leaves us with the problem of, well, how do we work out what to do about humans uh, having one of several different intersections which they could go for in DERF? Because that, that's what goals are in DERF. Like, get, get, the, um, the, get the, the ghosts to collide in intersections. Um, well, here's how we do it. We, first of all, formulate one POMDP per, so one MDP, one Markov decision process per goal, uh, um, where each of the goals is an intersection. And then we uh, solve it using a traditional MDP solver, so using value iteration in this particular case. Um, and then that gives us a plan which uh, will optimally try and get two ghosts to crash at the intersection that we've selected. Um, then we use this plan to try and work out which. Uh, so we use. So we have one of these per intersection that we're going to try and that we might want to try and crash ghosts at. And then we use this uh, to work out what the most likely action that a human would take, given that they had the goal of crashing ghosts together at a given intersection is. Um, we compute the posterior probabilities of each of these goals being the one that the human currently has um, by fancy mathematics. And then we adopt the goal, um, we adopt the most probable goal. So uh, we work out what the human's most likely trying to do, um, and then we say, all right, in that case, I'm going to help them do it. And the way that these MVPs are solved is actually by imagining so kind of that we have this, this puppeteer who's controlling both the human's avatar and also the sidekick's avatar. Um, and then we work out what the best thing for them jointly to do together ought to be at every time step. But then when we go back to the, um, to the, the sidekick's perspective in the actual playing of death, once we've worked out what goal we think that the human has, we assume that the human is going to play its half of the joint policy. So it's going to do its half of the plan, and we just do our half of the plan. We as the psychic. And that is how death works. But there are some problems. So uh, the first one is, because we're not working in a POMDP, we don't model the fact that we have uncertainty about the human's goals when we do the actual planning. So the planning was done by solving MDPs, and then we had a probability distribution over MDPs. Um, but what we really would like, to, what th 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 this is a cheat, right? Um, we're actually uncertain. We, we should actually take that uncertainty about the human's goals into account in our planning. So. A, a proper goal, sorry, a proper plan would say, if I am like 30% likely that the human has the goal of crashing them at an intersection in the bottom left, then I should perhaps move a bit towards that. But if I'm 70% sure that they're going to go to the to the right, then maybe I want to take an action which either tries to disambiguate between the two, um, the two possible goals that the human might have, or uh, even better, um, does something which like hedges our bets. Uh, but with the way Dirth is set up, we can't make that kind of inference, right? Um, because we don't have this idea of uh, uncertainty about human goals uh, built into the planning part. We only have it kind of in the execution part. And we can't have a block line in sight because that would make it a deck pom DP and that would be really bad. And um, we are also oblivious to what the human might think that the sidekick is doing. We don't take that into account in our plan. We don't try to model it at all. Um, and then this is the big one. Oh man, we ran out of space on the slide. <laughs> so in addition to all these modeling problems, so the model is, the model is kind of not robust enough to deal with certain with certain um, situations, we have computational problems, which is that even though we've simplified a whole bunch, computing policies still takes a long time. So we, we have to do it offline. And storing poli um, policies takes a lot of space. And 
In this little diagram over here, this little cartoon, I've tried to explain why it is without math that it takes a lot of space to store the policies which are used in DERF. Um, so just say that we have this small world with only uh, four possible places that each of these guys can be. So we have, we have Pinky, Pac-Man, and Quiet. Um, so the possible places that Pinky could stand um, are in each of these different squares. So there are four different places Pinky could stand. Um, then there are four different places that Pac-Man could stand, and four different because you can share squares, just so. And four different places that Clive could stand. Um, now you imagine this going on for every possible, for every different ghost that you add in, or even the sidekick when you add it in, and um, some combination of uh, different places that these guys are standing corresponds to one world state. So one world state might be. Pinky standing up here, Pac-Man standing over here, and Clyde standing down there. Or it might be Pinky standing over here, Pac-Man standing down here, and Clyde standing over there. And when you think about the number of different combinations that there could possibly be, um, there are four different places that Pinky could stand, four different places that Pac-Man could stand, four different places that Clyde could stand, which is four times four times four, um, or uh, three to the four. No, what am I saying? Four to the three. <laughs> four times four times four is four to the three. Okay. So if you added another, if you added another person, it would be four to the four. Another person would be four to the five. Another person would be four to the six. So the thing which is increasing here is the exponent, um, which counts the number of states, right? So the reason that it is incredibly costly uh, to consider every possible state of the world that might occur is because the number of possible states that there could be is exponential in the number of ghosts that there are. So um, what this means for dearth, for instance, is that if you had 10 ghosts plus the sidekick and also the player, then you would have number of squares in the world um, to the 12 possible states that, in, um, that you would have to have a rule for what to do for. Um, and this becomes a very large number very quickly, uh, and you run out of memory to be able to store all these eventualities. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? First of all, we're going to forget about all of those modeling problems uh, that I was talking about before, so don't worry about not being able to see around corners, don't worry about not knowing what humans are doing. Get rid of all of that jazz. Focus on the thing which is more pressing, which is we have this explosion in the size of the states, uh, in the number of the number of states in the world that we need to consider. And what this really comes down to is realizing that we don't really need a plan for what we're going to do in every possible state. Don't waste time considering states that we're probably never going to reach. Um, instead, just plan for a subset that we're likely to visit, and then just run with that, and if something goes bad, we'll just replan. And assuming that we can assuming that we can do this fast enough, assuming we can replan fast enough, then that's great. And it doesn't matter that we didn't have a, a totally optimal plan. Okay. So the I'm gonna give like an incredibly brief overview of uh, ways to approach this and the two ways that I've done this. Uh, the first one is Monte Carlo tree search. So the idea here is that uh, we're going to consider possible lines of play. And by a line of play, I mean like the action that I take. And uh, so the, ac the action that I and the, so that the sidekick and the human are going to take, and then the action that the uh, ghosts might take in response and then again our joint actions and then their joint actions and our joint actions their joint actions and the states which arise out of all of those action combinations being taken. So one way to visualize this is um, as this tree being built up. So the way to think about this is uh, each of these little nodes down here uh, is a state of the world and each edge is an action which takes you from one state to another state. 
So um, the basic strategy here is going to be that we don't really know what the best action to take is. So we're going to just pick one that seems OK or promising or that we don't know much about. And then we're going to kind of simulate how the rest of the game plays out. And then when the simulation ends, we're going to look at how good that outcome was. And then we're going to say, all right, well, that went terribly. So I'm going to try to avoid taking that action ever again. Or we might say, that went fabulously. I'm going to take that action in the future. Um, or we might say, that was indifferent, in which case we'll just kind of go, eh, I guess I try something else. Um, so the way that this is going to work, uh, so, oh, right, and the, the crucial thing about this is that what we're going to do is we're going to do this a lot of times. So we're going to work out what the best action to take from our current situation is by playing out many, many continuations of each of the actions that we could possibly take. Um, so we'll run many, many simulations. And the, the hope is that in ha after having run a ton of different simulations and looking at how, how the game could evolve after me, for instance, going north, um, then I'll have a really good idea of just how good it is to go north. Um, and there are two stages in doing this. So one of them is um, for places that I've seen before, so for states of the world that I've seen before, I already have kind of have an idea of how good some of the actions which come out of them are, because I've seen them before. Um, in those cases, uh, when I'm doing my simulations, I'm going to pick the actions which are just kind of empirically best, so ones that I've seen turn out well. And in this way, I'm going to try and focus my search through this tree of possible ways that the world could turn out uh, along more promising lines of play. So the idea is being is that if I saw this particular action turn out well uh, in the past, it's likely to turn out well in the future. Sure. So I should try a simulation which runs through it again, because like, all things considered, when it comes to actually no longer simulating and playing for real, um, then I'm probably going to pick actions which have had good outcomes in simulation. All right, and then the, the final thing is we also have this idea of a default policy, which is when I reach somewhere which I've never seen before, so a state of the world which I've never seen, um, then I'm going to just estimate which of these things is best, given that I don't really have any information about what the best action to pick is, so I'll just pick something which seems good according to a heuristic. Um, 